I don't think anything we do is a waste of time. I think whether it's stepping back or doing something that we learn from, it's all part of a process and we need to just go with the process and don't ever, don't ever think badly of ourselves for something we've done because we learn from all of that. We invited all animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics. Through respectful solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to another episode of Common Ground. I'm super excited to share this episode with you. It's one of our most robust conversations yet, and it actually went a bit long, so it's going to be split into three parts. So be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and hit that subscribe button so you can see the other episodes. With that, let's start the show. As animal advocates, we want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. But what about the overall strategy, and how do our tactics fit into this? What campaign should we be dedicating our limited time to? Which of these forms of advocacy was the biggest influence in you living vegan? Well, my biggest influence, obviously, nobody's going to be surprised by this, uh, in in the round, as it were, is Tom Reagan, because um, when I was a child, I I had a commitment to the idea of fairness. I, I used to, you know, that's not fair, this is fair, that kind of thing. And then when I read Reagan, it gave me a philosophical foundation for those feelings. And so that kind of like uh, set me up for life, as it were, in the sense that um, I suddenly had a way of expressing what I felt as a, as a child, if you like, uh, in a, a campaigning philosophical way. Yeah, and it looks like the results are in. This, I'm interested by this one. It looks like actually graphic footage has come out on top. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I've... I've because of the 10 poll limit option, I did lump together kind of social media versus actually watching a documentary, which to me is perhaps, I'd, I would have preferred to have split them out because I think sitting down to choosing to watch an hour or two documentary is much different than seeing a short clip unintentionally on social media. I'm not saying one's necessarily better than the other, but I do think that's a distinction to make. Um, I know for me, it was actually the non-graphic um, video on social media of a a uh, cow who was being used for her milk, being separated from her, from her young, just two minutes. There's no blood or anything, but that's when I really started to connect with them as individuals. Regret- regrettably, I did the vegetarian phase myself, and that's what really clicked for me, both as a dietary and as, as a philosophy to start living vegan. Uh, so I think like many others, I watched Earthlings, and that's what turned me vegan overnight. But now I look back and realize that although I'm happy I watched the documentary it's probably what led me to 12 to 18 months of just being incredibly angry not checking my privilege going out acting by any means necessary and falling into the trap of well what I now view as pretty oppressive dominating and aggressive outreach so although I am happy that at that time I watched it and I'm incredibly grateful for the documentary I kind of wish that my entry was different. And for just as an example, if my entry, and I only found out just about Roger four months ago, maybe five months ago, if my entry point had been Tom Reagan, then Roger, or some people that I now look to and read their work, I could have done much better work earlier. So I just think it's an interesting dynamic that a lot of people do get into the movement or become vegan because of earthlings. And I wonder whether that also Although it's good that you watch it and change, it also, in a way, maybe there's, an, like I said, an interesting dynamic where until you're willing to critique yourself or look at critical thinking, maybe it also suppresses you in, a, in growth um, as an activist and your willingness to, to look at, for example, human, um, human oppression issues as well. We've had some kind of like internal animal rights show debate about this because we seem to think there's a lot of educational work to do within the vegan bubble, but then the issue is always about how do you get out of it too, especially if it means using the mass media, which is always a terrible kind of dilemma for social movements in general terms, not, not just our movement, but when, when social movements use the mass media, because it's seductive, you know, the mass is seductive, but they lose control of the message. This may not be typical, of this particular question, but I wanted to select several of the options 
You know, like I was initially went vegan because of a conversation with a friend, but that friend had been considering it because of hardcore and punk rock music. And then they, they went vegan because they saw a, a pita table at a concert they went to. So like, those are three different impressions of, of the, the concept of animal rights or veganism or the introduction to it before I took the, the leap. Um, and I think that that's really common with people. You know, people might say that they went vegan after watching a documentary, but before they sat down for two hours to watch that documentary, they may have seen protest coverage on the news or posts on social media or uh, vegan options increasing in their supermarket, you know? So I just think it's important to realize that, uh, well, we might have, we might choose one thing that made us go vegan. There were other impressions and other, other reasons behind that. Should we be focusing on individuals, the supply or the political system? I'd probably be in the individual demand camp myself. I think there's a lot of exciting new ways we can start to look at the supply and overall system. I just can't help but wonder when roughly 1% of the population is vegan, if we can really address that in the way that's necessary. I can't help but wonder if we should be focusing more on the demand side of things until we get to that tipping point because unless we're start, we disrupt that cultural species, speciesism, which I acknowledge, we can do um, through these other methods. But however, to me, the individual focus and, and, and not just individuals, I think just in general, targeting the overall demand through, you know, media campaigns can, can it's not just, you know, one-on-one -on -one type discussions. This can be on a mass scale too. The farmers get huge subsidies, but, but people think it's only like the subsidies that, that it's, you'd find on the internet say for you know for having cattle and having the land and that but they also get subsidy they get grants for building farm sheds and you know everything to do on the farm even roadways and everything to, and they get grants for um, tractors and all sorts of other machinery and also like around me here i know farmers uh, Another thing that people might know, but they, they, they used to have medical cards for years. Even the rich farmers all around here had medical cards, whereas other people had to pay for the medicine in the hospitals and stuff. You know, it, it really goes deep, these, what covers subsidies, it really goes deep. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's tremendous what, what they get compared to other people, you know. You know, it should be a great focus for, for, for all the vegans to focus on these subsidies because we can, we can change a few million to, to grow in vegetables and organic food and stuff like it make, makes a huge change. And like if it could get going, like people would know that there'd be loads of work in, in, in growing organic veg and stuff, you know, so it, 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 I think it'd build momentum if we could really get started. Yeah, and, and if, if I can ask you a question back to that, Declan, I guess yeah. everyone, I think we'd probably all agree subsidies are a big problem. I yeah. guess the question becomes if 99% of the population isn't necessarily fully on board with living vegan and the philosophy of animal rights how do yeah. we get that to happen yeah but you know, is it a bit maybe early in the movement to be campaigning for that no no but uh, see from from walking on the street with roger and sarah and uh, whoever else i know there uh, in, in the on here today but but people don't know that the farmers get these huge subsidies you know even even people living in the country don't in the countryside don't know you know you, you take a block of land around me uh, you know, a square mile, say, you know, there could be only four or five farmers in a square mile, the farms, you know, so big kind of, but in that square mile, you, you could have 30, 40 houses, you know, living in a square mile. So, you know, they don't even know people in the country, and especially in the city, people don't know that the farmers get these subsidies. Like, we know that from, from talking to people on the streets. They, can, they can't believe it when we, when we tell them the huge subsidies they get, you know. So, uh, it's a big thing, Jeremy, just to get across to people, you know what I mean? So... I see what you're saying. So it's not necessarily specifically going straight to the source. It's almost educating the public. Yeah, yeah. That's building true. awareness that these subsidies yeah, are, are actually true. in place in the first place. Yeah, yeah. That's I see true. what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do think it might be an area of political campaigning that might be quite uh, useful for us to engage in now, or at least for some some vegans to do to do that. Yeah, because isn't it with sheep? I've heard that the subsidies are the sole source of the profit, and if you remove the subsidies, there'd be no business. So I used to be um, a believer in the system change thing. 
you know, and I had a lot of strategic ideas about how to do the, that. Because this is the, P, the NFU is basically the PR propaganda arm of the so-called farming industry. And having looked at that and the way these, you know, what Declan was also saying about, you know, well, there's also the environmental side of, you know, the pollution, the species destruction because of animal so-called agriculture. And also, as uh, Jeremy was saying, the 1% of the populationness of uh, vegans. So I'm sort of thinking, how possible is it to reform this system, this capitalist neoliberal system? Is it possible? I wrote a book recently called Total Liberation by somebody called Anonymous. Um, and this person was sort of saying, well, is it possible? Is it reform or is it revolution? And I'm now starting to think, given where a lot of vegans seem to be in terms of our preparedness or not to do anything sort of fairly spectacular, number one. And number two, you know, we're not just living in the vegan bubble. We're living in times of catastrophic climate breakdown and ecological collapse, okay? So as well as the sort of, you know, billions of sentient beings that are being tortured to death, as we all know, all the time, so for me, there's a, a bit of a sense of urgency here. Um, so I don't want to claim to be an expert. Uh, I've only recently been exposed to this more and more through uh, um, vegan Batgirl uh, in America who focuses a lot on this and lobbying. But it's about subsidies and also about bailouts. And it's uh, Brad just asked a question in the group is, do the subsidies and potential bailouts earn farmers more money than the actual raising and selling of animal bodies and lives and so I, I would suggest if anyone does want to know more it's a really good source to look at but it comes down to the fact that farmers and you see a lot of the stories especially in america and every country might be slightly different so i don't want to just generalize everyone but it's it it makes more sense for a farmer to breed an animal because they will make more money in the subsidies and the potential bailouts than to not breed them at all, because they know they've always got a security blanket no matter what happens. Are we focusing too much on education or awareness building and not enough on disrupting the supply through pressure campaigns? Yeah, my, my position is that education is uh, absolutely crucial but I'm not opposed to um, pressure campaigning um, and preferably and really they, they would have to incorporate an educational part of it. And so that can be done and that kind of should be done. And I don't really see why um, a pressure campaign on the one hand couldn't have a symbiotic relationship with street outreach, as it were, on, on, the, on the other. Um, so in that sense, um, it all kind of ends up with kind of education because our number one target is cultural speciesism, and that's 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 what we've uh, we've got to tackle. Now, whether we want to take down individual targets whilst we're doing that is one thing, but we ought, we ought to kind of, in terms of our general claims making, make it very clear that our ultimate target is is the you know to create well, I would say to create a, a vegan world. Um, others might disagree with that, but that that's that's where I go. But in terms of um, pressure campaigning with a with an education element I'm, I'm grand with that i guess the key to me is if i mean i guess we can get into in a little bit whether the education as i prefer to say awareness building works i'm just concerned that if we diversify too much away from that before we know where we're going to i know for myself staying motivated is a, is a key um factor in my advocacy and if i have this voice in the back of my head saying you know, awareness building or street outreach or, um, you know, so-called education doesn't work. And I stop doing that, but don't have something to go to. That's where I think there's a serious risk. So I, I'm all for having the discussions, but I think we should have something a bit more tangible before we go on. And hopefully we get some of those tangible ideas here today. Uh, the education is very important. And then we, not only the, the education, but also we should also focus. We can do more uh, multitasking. Education on one side and then the other side, be more active and like disruptions or something like this. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to say from my experience, cause I set up 
um, AV, Anonymous for the Voiceless, and the Save Movement and DXE in Dublin, like a ch as chapters. So I'm very well aware of kind of franchise activism and kind of, I suppose they're, they're, they're single tactics in of, in of themselves. But um, I suppose it's very simple, like pressure campaigns, which, which I've learned through Jake, um, that like you can use multiple tactics as part of a strategy. And that's such a simple idea, but I don't know why I never thought of it or understood it. I used to think it was speciesist to focus on say fur campaigning, which NARA, which are a local group in Ireland, were focusing on. Um, I thought it was speciesist because I was like, well, why do they care more about uh, furred animals than they do other animals, like ones who are exploited in the food industry? Um, but of course they don't. They care about all all animals. Uh, so I don't know where that came from. Maybe it was kind of kind of like a elitist AV thing. I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm equally skeptical of, or I'm just skeptical in general nowadays, um, thinking that, that what Jake is saying is 100% correct either. But I'm really open to hearing loads of different uh, opinions and views on it. But I just wanted to say, yeah, my experience with like activism franchises hasn't been positive. I'm quite angry. At how I feel a lot of time wasted on those. Yeah, I just think it doesn't take much effort to, while you're doing street activism and start having conversations, encouraging people to change their lifestyle, to say also sign this petition, you know, to ban slaughter in our city or to uh, close down a lo local butcher shop or something, and then make it a little more focused to have an actual target instead of just a lifestyle change in general. So if the, the footage that you're showing is from suppliers of the local butcher shop or suppliers from farms that uh, sell their products in your local grocery store, then you can take and make the issue hit closer to home, which is going to resonate more with the folks that you're talking to. And then uh, a little victory closing down that butcher shop isn't going to save a lot of animals lives, but it's going to invigorate people to get involved with the campaign. It's going to inspire people. There is a division in the movement, which is um, probably largely uh, created by Gary Francione, who ironically is not in the movement, in the sense that uh, if, you know, you've got this issue of veganism as a moral baseline, but also this issue that um, single issue uh, is, is bad, right? So you've got, you've got those, those issues. Whereas the ironic thing about that is that Francione believes that single issues can be abolitionized. And so you can focus on a single thing while still having an overarching abolitionist uh, vegan message, for example. Um, and so th there seems to be quite a lot of confusion about, you know, why these things can't live together. And obviously, I know there's a controversy in terms of, um, you know, DXE, boycott veganism, that th they, they want uh, a action to be the moral baseline. And I'm sure there's some people who could speak to that uh, here today. Um, but, you know, I don't see why these things can't actually live together be because then they're, they're, they're kind of not as bad as, as Francione initially said they were. And as I said, he does support them himself, ironically, um, although he tends to think that he's the only one who could do them. Uh, but, you know, they can be abolitionized. And that just basically means that you, you put a single focus of something into a vegan context or, or an abolitionist context or an animal rights context. I'm just feeling confused about how people think change, you know, like massive change, which is what we're trying to get to, like enormous change, huge. I mean, the biggest amount of change that you could actually imagine would happen in any society is going to happen. So what I'm saying is, do we as a movement have a theory of change I only came across that concept, the theory of change, a couple of years ago. And my belief is that we don't have a theory of change. We have lots of sort of a scattergun approach of sort of basically tactics with a little bit of sort of strategy every so on. I think it's very interesting what people have been saying. Um, my view is I think that um, there isn't any magic bullet here. There isn't any, oh, this is the way that we've all got to do things 
I, um, I think that both education, outreach, pressure campaigning, I think all of it is important. And we might want to do different things at different times of our life or even, you know, somebody might want to do a cube and then go sabbing the next day. It's all good. Um, I think that's what we learned during the badger cull is that we had a lot of people come to help badgers on the single issue campaign of direct action. So people came into the field and they were eating meat, they were drinking dairy. Um, we set things up and we had a vegan kitchen and, you know, it was quite a gentle sort of, um, oh yeah, we don't drink that because it's got cow's milk and then you explain. Um, and people, a lot of those people are now vegan and they're sabs or they're doing other things. So it was effective to do that. It was effective to, uh, on many levels, in a, as a contribution to the movement as such. And when you look at the fur trade or we've got a brilliant local group here uh, near Malvern and they do some fantastic stuff. They... Um, you know, like goldfish being sold at fairs and stuff, little things like that, you know, locally. And I think that's very underestimated. And you look at it worldwide, people doing stuff like that, I think is very, very important. Well, I don't think frustrators or um, give up. Like, like the animals need, like they need every one of us. Like, like you know, like, like we, we, we lose a lot of people from, from people who are beside us on the street. You know, we have everything on our side, like, and we have we have the the climate change and the you know overpopulation. Everything is on our side to 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 push through veganism at veganism at the moment. Like everything, everything you could think of is on our side. Like you know, global everything like that, and uh, food food shortages probably as well. You know, so uh, like Willow, dear God, don't feel frustrated, please. You, you're anyone else, you know, like. Uh, battle on and do stuff and join other groups, you know, and then you don't always have to start a new group, uh, join in with another one, Willow, you know, but, but, but do join, do start a new one if you have a good idea, definitely, you know. Well, um, I appreciate that support, Declan. Um, but I suppose I'm just kind of uh, uh, taking a step back and list, trying to listen a bit more to kind of what this movement I'm in is and kind of I think I've, I've came into the movement, I came into the movement in quite a celebrity culture privileged way that I've kind of missed that radical, radical element, which is kind of the core of it. I suppose I'm kind of just taking a step back and figuring out what that is and learning it properly. Yeah, but well, you know, the, the radical element, you know, like vegan outreach, talking to people, like street outreach, you know, like it really works. You know, when we started in 2014 and Roger in 2012, like people didn't know what the word vegan meant. You'd hear people walking by and they'd say, like, what's a vegan? You know, and for two or three years they were doing that constantly. But after about, you know, from 2016 or so, people were saying, my sister's vegan, my brother's vegan, my friend's vegan, mother's vegan, father, you know. Agreed. So it really has changed in, in five or six years, you know, Willow. So, so, you know, you don't have to do anything ra radical, uh, Willow. You know, you can just do, 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 you know, simple things like, like that other woman was saying simple things she was saying, you, you know. I, I'm, not, I'm not negating uh, vegan education altogether. I'm kind of more... Um, or what you what you do yourself, but kind of more of what like Jay Conroy has been saying recently, which is kind of like vegan education, maybe linked in with a pressure campaign or something like that. I'm I'm not negating what you what you do or. Yeah, I know that I know that will. Yeah, but, but like, God, don't give up. Will okay, keep you know? Won't you keep keep going on? I guess that's all I just want to say or anyone else that's you know maybe maybe having a you know an off time kind of you know but there's just plenty you can do with it that's all it's just saying to you, you know yeah. i'm great to see you Willow, again. yeah yeah you too Declan. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we were just talking about um goals something that jake uh, cranky vegan has spoken about on his youtube uh, channel before is although it's great to have larger goals it's also really important to have smaller and more realistic ones 
because at the end of the day, humans do like to feel like they're winning. And if you feel like you're winning, it can provide motivation to want to do more. Um, and then just another thing uh, that was just discussed. So um, I saw in the comments about like taking time out to reevaluate. And I just don't think any, anyone that decides they want to take time out from whether it's uh, campaigning, outreach, direct action, because they want to take a step back to critique themselves and others, to learn more and to become a, a more well-rounded individual and activist. No one should be made to feel bad. And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric out there to say, if you do that, you're potentially letting animals down. And it's just simply not true because fundamentally you're thinking about them because you want to better yourself and become a more well-adverse and rounded individual. I mean, to me, yeah, to me, education is, is just, like, it's kind of it's kind of the most important because of the society that we're in and, and just, just what we think. I don't really think that, like, lots of people are really bad, horrible people that want to do these things to animals. I actually think that they're not, that they just don't think about it because that's where I was at. Like, just do not think about animals at all. You don't think about what you're eating and they don't realise. So, it education really does plant the seeds and um help um yeah well uh, to me and then and then also another form of uh, activism in in my eyes is just just speaking about it to people just speaking about veganism to to people as you go along through to your life just um and just kind of uh setting a good example to them so is that me? <laughs> That's you. Welcome, Mom. For, for those of you who don't know, this Hi. is my mother. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have one really quick point. Um, I don't think anything, if we're um, a committed vegan, I don't think anything we do is a waste of time. I think whether it's stepping back or doing something that we learn from, it's all part of a process. And we need to just go with the process and don't ever, don't ever think badly of ourselves for something we've done because we learn from all of that. That's, that's my point. It's all a process that we learn from as we go along. What pressure campaign tactic do you think would be the most efficient and effective? Yeah, you and I tend to focus on kind of the, the, the demand side, but I think your history obviously speaks to a lot of this. You know, the theories of change, this kind of issues, we, we, do, we do have some of those, not, not least total liberation. And um, it, it is true that, you know, most of the things that we're talking about here, we might not have time to do all these. This is one of, one of the issues that, uh, that we probably need to think about. You know, there might not be time for pressure campaigning. You know, there might not be time for education because you know, the, because of the, uh, the, the global uh, climate um, crisis, we, we do really kind of need a kind of revolution. And in that sense, you don't tend to see it. I mean, you, you can see the way that the, the, the COVID thing is panning out. Whereas all I see on the mass media is that people are dying to get back to, to what was before. And of course, it was what was before that was destroying everything. You know, so we do we do give a bit of lip service to this idea of, li of the new normal. But, um, you know, so w whatever we come up with here, you know, I'm a bit, being a bit pessimistic here. I know that. But whatever we come up here, we, we, we've got to over, have an overarching thing about wh whether we've got even time for any of this. You know? Thank you for watching this episode of Common Ground. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was quite a long recording session, and we set a new record, so it's being divided into three parts. So if you want to see those other parts, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us on social media. We also want to have the most diverse representation of the animal advocate community as possible, so please share our Facebook events, and you may want to consider using that Facebook invite friends feature so we can be sure this is getting to as many animal advocates as possible. Thanks for watching, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.